Yeah, so this was a chapter. Welcome back in everyone to One Piece chapter 1085. My name is Sai and today we're going to go through the chapter and just talk a little bit about it. So with that being said, let's get into it. Unsurprisingly, we pick up where we left off last week with Cobra talking to Emu. But what is surprising is that Emu refers to themselves in the third person, and they also call themselves Mu. Just by doing a simple search online, you can see some of the meanings it holds. It can mean negative, it can mean emptiness, nothingness, void. There's just a lot with this name, and I am curious to see why Emu refers to themselves as this. Is this how they view themselves? Are they speaking like this because they are royalty? It's just fascinating, because whenever somebody refers to themselves in the third person, they don't typically change their name, per se. Another thing that I do find interesting about this whole naming situation is that after Emu refers to themselves as Mu in the third person, Cobra doesn't really harp on that at all. He actually goes back to the Emu name saying, hey, Emu, that sounds really familiar. If I recall correctly, that was one of the 20 kings that blank. And then that is when Emu cuts him off, saying, hey, even if you ask those questions, I'm not going to answer. So based on the context clues, we can assume that somebody with the name of Emu was one of the original 20 king or queens. But what is interesting though is that Oda doesn't give us that 100% confirmation. Emu doesn't say, yep, that's right, you got me. So because of that, there is that 1% chance that Oda could use that wiggle room to make Emu a different person or give this more meaning. Maybe Emu was one of those 20 kings or queens, but there's something different about them from the rest of them. Which I guess wouldn't be super far-fetched since that person is now sitting on the empty throne. And also, I just want to throw this out right here in the beginning of the video, but this chapter gives us way more questions than actual answers. So a lot of this chapter is going to be me saying, hey, it could be this, but then again, it could be that. So just, just be ready for that. I like to stay open-minded when it comes to One Piece and how Oda can get crazy with the plot sometimes. So after Emu skirts King Cobra's question, we get a top-down view of Emu sitting on the throne. And this could be me spinning something out of nothing, but Emu in this panel looks oddly flat. This could just be the work of Oda's classic silhouette structures, but there's just no real definition to Emu at all. It's almost like looking at a shadow on a wall. And I know, this sounds kind of weird to say right now, but trust me, I will get back to this flatness here in a bit. So Emu goes on and tells us a little bit about the D, and how 800 years ago, the D was their greatest opposition. But nowadays, the D doesn't really mean all too much, and that they're all just empty shells in this era because they do not know the true meaning of the D. But nonetheless, the D has prevailed throughout time, and that's all because of Lily's blunder, Lily's mistake. We learn that Lily's mistake was the spreading of the poneglyphs. You know, it's just a little oopsie daisy, right? Oh, you trip over a rock and then boom, poneglyphs around the world. So Emu says, wait, was that a mistake? Or did Lily make that mistake on purpose? And this is when we see that this has all been a build-up to Emu's main question for King Cobra. His only question. What was Lily Nefertari's actual name? What was the name written down in that letter you have? King Cobra says, it was Nefertari D. Lily. And before we get to the next part, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think this is very interesting. So now that we know that Lily had the D initial, I'm just really curious to see if she was always a D member or not. Because later in this chapter, we see Ace just casually giving Sabo the D. And using that context of casually giving somebody the D, in Lily's scenario, it makes a lot of sense. When Lily allied with Emu and the others, she didn't have the D. But by the end of the war, by the time she was tasked with, you know, spreading or deleting the Poneglyphs, she said, you know what? I am a D member. And that is why she made her mistake. And that is why in this chapter, Emu's main question, the almighty Emu's question to King Cobra is simply, did Lily have the D? There's a lot of interesting paths that Oda can go with this D narrative. And honestly, I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this. What is your D theory? Is it something that is exclusive by bloodline? Or no, is it something that anybody can inherit? Anybody can inherit the will of D. And of course, nowadays, it doesn't really hold any meaning because nobody knows the meaning, but maybe once they learn it, that is when it will regain its weight. But yeah, 
let me know what you think about the D. So one thing that I thought was really funny about this whole conversation is that for some reason, the Gorosei are all strapped. Uh, it, it's kind of a meme. Um, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this initially, but the Gorosei mid convo just start whipping out the glizzies. And it's like, okay, King Cobra wasn't raising his fist. He wasn't raising his voice, but they're just all strapped up. They're ready to go, pointing it at poor King Cobra in a wheelchair. And here's the thing. Later in the chapter, you know, I, I don't want to spoil it, but later in the chapter, we learn that they can transform into giant monsters, which really just makes me wonder why they had these pistols in the first place. Maybe they didn't think they would have to transform and, you know, Cobra being all old and decrepit, maybe they thought they could just take them out ASAP with a couple pistols. But yeah, nonetheless, I thought it was a little bit silly. I thought it was great. But after King Cobra drops the D on everybody, Emu gets pretty upset. Right when he hears it, he whips out this arrow-looking attack. Or at least, that's how people described it in the beginning. But when I saw this, I didn't see an arrow. I saw a devil's tail. Just by looking at the panel of this attack and the way it ebb and flows, it really does seem like a tail. And if you look at it and you're like, wait, what kind of tail would that be, Sai? Well, it reminds me of a cartoon devil. So we all know that Oda loves old school cartoons. I mean, Oda went on an interview and said that Tom and Jerry was what inspired Gear 5th. And if we're going in line with old school cartoons, there's nothing more classic than the cartoon devil. And that just might be what Eam is based off of or has powers similar to. So right here is the Tom and Jerry interview. And I'm just going to grab a line that Oda says that really just piqued my interest when I saw this attack on Cobra. So Oda says, when I first tried to draw Gear 5th, it was very difficult because in the world of Tom and Jerry, it works because there's two of them. I suffered because of this difference in attitude when I looked at Luffy being the only one that makes jokes and pranks in battle while his opponent doesn't. But this time, I feel like I was able to draw this properly. And right here, he's referring to Kaido and how Kaido, you know, he wasn't really cartoony in the battle. He was only cartoony when Luffy attacked him. But if Luffy were to fight Emu, and Emu being a cartoonish devil already, then this could fulfill what Oda was talking about here he would be creating this world of Tom and Jerry antics that he referred to. While I was reading this chapter, the main thing that just kept on popping into my head whenever I saw Emu or his attacks even, I just always kept on thinking of the devil from Cuphead and how they're kind of one-to-one -one in a way. Just the way they come down the throne, the way they eat fire, the tail, just everything about this kind of fits. And honestly, I would love to hear what you guys have to say. What do you think of Emu's power? And what do you think about this weird tail-like arrow? So going on a little bit, Sabo witnesses all of this. And right when Cobra gets attacked, that is when the alarm bells ring and Sabo comes out with a fire fist against the Gorosei. He hits him with it. And then he runs that fire all the way up to Emu, who transforms and just eats the fire like it's Tuesday's lunch. The Gorosei and Emu are completely unfazed by Sabo's fire fist, and then Sabo tips his hat and says, wow, this is something straight out of hell. This is a hellish scene, which again, I think reinforces the idea of the cartoon devil, and, you know, we get some crazy transformations behind him. So now here comes another big question. What? are these transformations? Are these actually Zoan Devil Fruits, or is this something else entirely? Is this perhaps a brand new transformation that we have not yet witnessed in the world of One Piece? Because if these guys are from the Void Century, then anything is possible. So during last night's livestream, we all sat down and started guessing what these silhouettes might actually be of. And granted, while I don't think we hit the nail on the head, I do believe we came up with some pretty cool ideas. So first, we have the Gorosei on the far left. He looks like some woolly mammoth creature, and the one animal that we all kind of came to a consensus of was a warthog, because he has the ears, he has the tusks, it kind of makes sense, right? And then now we have the bird. Uh, it kind of looks like Big News Morgans, it kind of looks like a phoenix, but those models are taken. 
So another thing we came to was this could be a cockatrice. The cockatrice is a mythological creature. It is a snake or chicken born from an egg. We saw it at Impel Down, and this could be the devil fruit model of that. Next, we have this thing, and honestly, I, I have no clue what this is. It is the strangest silhouette I have ever seen in One Piece. Next, we have this thing, and somebody had a really cool idea that this kind of looks like Umebozu, which is a Japanese yokai. And I even think it kind of looks like the spirits from Spirited Away. And then lastly, we have Saint Saturn, the only Gorosei whose name we actually know of. And he kind of looks like a Minotaur. But then again, we already have a Minotaur Devil Fruit in Impel Down. But like I said, who's to say that this isn't a Zoan Fruit and he is the original Minotaur. And also, if you close and kind of squint your eyes at him, he kind of looks like the skull at Onigashima as well. A cool idea I heard people floating around in the comment section was that this also could be a corrupted devil fruit. These could be nightmare devil fruits, perhaps. And that is why Sabo says this looks very hellish. And if devil fruits were born from dreams, these could be born from nightmares instead. And I really like that idea. I think that would be perfect for the Gorosei and even Emu, because when Vegapunk was talking about devil fruits, he was like, yeah, those things are born from desires and dreams and wishes. And because of that, they're hated by Mother Nature. But what would be loved by Mother Nature instead? What would be the opposite of devil fruits? Maybe they're angel fruits, or maybe these are fruits born from things that people don't want. Undesirables, nightmares, and etc. I think this could be a route that Oda could go with. And like I said in the beginning of this video, Oda gave us more questions than answers with this chapter. So, going on though, King Cobra's like, hey, I know Luffy, you're his brother, aren't you? And Sabo gets a little smile on his face saying, yep, that's my brother. And then he starts carrying King Cobra out of the room, and that is when King Cobra says, hey, I need you to do something for me. I'm not going to make it out of here. So please, tell Luffy and Vivi that we have the D as well. So there's a lot of reasons I actually love this segment. And it all kind of stems from the fact that Sabo is telling this to Dragon in the present day. So Dragon is also learning about this. And if King Cobra's final wish is to go tell Luffy and Vivi about this, then this could be leading up to the Dragon and Luffy reunion, as well as Sabo too. And then, on the Vivi side of things, if Sabo and Dragon visit Vivi, who is currently with Big News Morgans, they could spread the truth around the world. They could spread the D, they could spread the crazy Emu Gorosei revelation. There is so much that the revolutionaries can do with this information. Once Sabo gets the request from King Cobra, it spurs on the Ace Sabo Luffy flashback where Sabo gets the D. And I am curious to see how the Viz official will translate this, but they call him sa di bo They put it in between, and if you kind of say it all together, it kind of sounds like Sad Boy which would be a really interesting parallel to Joy Boy. And maybe this might be telling of what the Void Sentry was like. We had Joy Boy on one side, and then we had Sad Boy on the other. So, we cut back to reality, and we see the arrow-like tail coming in for another attack. And what's interesting about this panel is that the way this attack is drawn, it seems like the arrow, or tail, whatever you want to call it, it's very flat. It's like on the ground, and then only near the end does it start spurting up and gets its shadow. And if you recall what I said earlier in the chapter, when Emu was sitting on the throne, they just look really flat. There is something really strange going on with this character. I feel like it definitely has to do with its transformation, but it is something to keep in mind going forward. Maybe we are just fighting a cartoonish devil, and he is like a picture book come to life. So, going on though, they try to dodge this arrow, and it doesn't really work out too well. Sabo and King Cobra get hit by this, and just looking at the panel of Sabo taking damage, it's like, whoa. Whatever this is, it has enough attack power to 1. Wound Sabo so much that we see the white of his eyes, and 2. It can hurt Logia users. And it's like, alright! I guess this tail thing is imbued with hockey. Like, keep in mind, this is a basic attack. This isn't some crazy giant named Thunder Bagua by Emu. This is just Emu's potential tail 
coming out and hitting Sabo from behind. So after they get hit by this, Cobra just accepts his fate, and he decides to spend his last moments, one, protecting Sabo, and two, reciting Lily's letter. Unfortunately, we don't get to hear all of what King Cobra has to say, because the Gorosei members just start screaming from ear to ear, but we do get the finale of Cobra's speech, where he says to hoist and raise the flag of the dawn to the world. And you can call me a madman for this, but I just think that the will of D and the D initial might just stand for dawn. In a way, it's kind of been in our faces this entire time. From chapter 1 or volume 1 being named Romance Dawn, to Luffy being the sun god, to the straw hat being symbolic of the dawn, to the dawn of Wano, to the sun pirates, you know, after being liberated and freeing people, having the sun as their symbol, it's kind of been there this entire time. And not to mention, the way Cobra talks about the dawn in his conclusion, it's not like symbolic or metaphorical, it's not like, oh, bring the dawn into Wano, it's literally raise the flag of the dawn, as if the dawn was a pirate crew or a nation. The Dawn, the way Cobra is describing it, is a group. So I think it just makes a lot of sense that the D does stand for that. And of course, again, it could be jumping the gun a little bit too soon, but it just makes the most sense in this context. So after King Cobra's passionate speech, we fast forward a little bit in time and we see that Sabo has somehow successfully escaped the throne room. And we also see that Wapple is hiding in the background watching through a peephole. Wapple, rightfully so, starts running away in fear for his life because he saw a little bit too much. He does not use doors anymore, he starts eating through the walls like Pac-Man, and that is when he runs into Vivi, who is currently being held captive by CP0. So Jabra and Khalifa end up giving us the lowdown on what's been going on at Marie Joie. We learn that Sai and Leo officially declared themselves Straw Hat Grand Fleet members in front of everybody, and we also learn the reason that Fujitora and Ryokugyu are not present currently is because they're in a heated battle over Fujitora letting the slaves go. Yeah, it's a bad day to be a Ryokugyu fan. Um, I didn't think he would go as far as to fight for the Celestial Dragon's honor and slaves, but yeah. There we have it. The reason why Fujitora and Ryokugyu are not present during the Shirahoshi incident and the kidnapping Kuma incident is simply because they got into an inner squabble amongst morality. So now, this brings us to the finale of the chapter where Wapple busts through the wall and Vivi jumps alongside him in a ploy to escape CP0. And it works because we do know that they both escape and end up on Big News Morgan's blimp. So here's the thing though. And this is what I'm really curious about next chapter. But with Wapple and Vivi trying to escape Marie Joie, the only real way to get out of this place is through the Red Port. And we know that Shirahoshi and the Neptune brothers are currently heading to the Red Port as well. And who else is at the Red Port? Garp. So I'm really curious to see if Garp will actually come in next chapter and help these people escape. Even if Vivi and Wapple are not the ones who run into Garp, we do know that Shirahoshi and the Neptune brothers will, considering the fact that Garp is the one who brings them back to Fishman Island. I think Garp making an appearance during this flashback would be perfect, because one, we already know he doesn't like Celestial Dragons, two, he doesn't really follow world government orders, and three, he does like people who are affiliated with Luffy, like Shirahoshi and like Princess Vivi. And not to mention, now that Vivi is revealed to be a D member, people of the D clan are always connected by fate. So having Garp run into Vivi, a fellow D, would just make a lot of sense. Oh yeah, one more thing I do want to talk about before we end off this segment of the video, but going back to the Reverie meeting, after we learn that King Wapple and King Cobra won't be attending anymore, we end off on a very interesting line. Mr. Hamburger says, Now, about the independence issue from four countries' alliance in the north. And that's all we get of that situation. And this could be something, this could be nothing, but the fact that this is in a Sabo flashback could hold some value since Dragon the Revolutionary is the one learning this information. We already know that Dragon has seven nations that just recently rebelled on their side. 
maybe this will give way to more nations joining Dragon's Coalition. Or this could even be, you know, four out of the seven. Who really knows? But either way, I think this is build up that more people are going to wish for independence against the world government. Whew. With all that being said, it is now time to move on to the comments from the previous videos. The first one we have says, This is crazy, seeing so much unfold. I can't believe we're getting emu attacks and full sentences from them instead of goofy silhouettes. And I 1000% agree. I mean, just a couple chapters ago, when we got the God Knight silhouettes, it was a singular panel. We had to zoom in to see what these guys kind of look like. But in this chapter, Oda went hog wild. He gave us multiple panels, multiple silhouettes, different angles, full sentences. It's crazy. And that is how you know we are in the final saga. He is not holding back. So now, on to the next one. It says, Emu isn't him, it's them. Like when Zoro was describing Blackbeard when they first met. That's where my mind went to when he referred to himself in the third person. And another thing I heard people say about Emu speaking in the third person is that that could just be how royalty speaks. Royalty sometimes refer to themselves in the third person. And I agree, I think there's a lot of things with this, but the main thing that I want to focus on is just the Moo name. If he's talking to himself in third person, why does he feel the need to change his name a little bit? I feel like there's something there, and I feel like that's why the it's them situation could apply to Emu in a strange way. So next, it says, I love the idea of monsters being final villains in the world. And I wholeheartedly agree. In a weird way, it kind of follows the buildup that Oda's been having with the series. Like with Whitebeard, he was the world's strongest man. And then we go to Kaido, the world's strongest creature. And now we have the Gorosei and Emu, who are kind of like the world's strongest monsters in a way. So this next comment is actually one of my favorites. It says, Lily could have had the pawpaw fruit, which would have made spreading out the poneglyphs easy. And I love this idea 100%. And the reason why is because of an old SBS. So in this old SBS, which I don't know if I'll pull it up or not because, you know, it's kind of hard to find. But in this old SBS, if I put it right here, somebody asks Oda about the naming scheme of the Devil Fruits in the Straw Hat crew. And if you start listing all of them, you'll realize that they're all numbers listed from 0 to 10 with the only two numbers missing being 1-9, which perfectly fits the Nikyu Nikyu no Mi, the Paw Paw Fruit. So people were speculating whether or not Kuma would join the crew at some point, or somebody with the Paw Paw Fruit would join the crew. And what's interesting is that one, we didn't get that, and two, is that Luffy actually offered Vivi a spot in the crew, but Vivi didn't join, she still hasn't joined. But what if this actually is a parallel to something in the past? What if Lily did have the pawpaw fruit and it's kind of symbolic of the 1919 that is missing from the present day Joy Boys crew, which is Luffy, of course. It, it, it's weird drawing parallels from two characters from like 800 years ago, but you guys see what I mean. I really do think this could be the case and it could be a perfect explanation as to why they wanted Lily to be the one to dispose of the Poneglyphs because she could easily just boop, 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 and then they're gone. Or she could boop, 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 and they're spread around the world. On to the next comment, it says, with CP9's failure at Eni's lobby, how did they get promoted to CP0? Hey, your guess is as good as mine. I'm gonna say it's because they got nobody else strong enough to fill those shoes. And... There is something missing there, because if you recall the Enis Lobby cover story with CP9, they went on a whole training montage. They went after Spandam. They wanted to kill him. And then we have a two-year time skip, and then boom, there's CP0. So for a brief moment in time, they were anti-world government. So something must have happened there, and I do wonder if Oda will actually shed light on how that transition actually transpired. Next comment says, I like the idea that the D name was more of a clan that can be given to anyone by another D member. If Joy Boy was once a leader of the Dawn Pirates and had a grand fleet that all took the D when they shared a cup of sake together, it would create a nice parallel to Luffy. Yes, I definitely agree with this. This is my head canon said way better. Like, just going back to this chapter and how Sai and Leo 
declared themselves as members of the Straw Hat fleet. That is how I see it. Maybe just back then they were like, hey, we're a part of the D clan. We're a part of the D family. That is a great parallel and we love to see it. And by the end of the series, I am curious to see if the D will still be prominent or if Luffy, the, the new joy boy of the era, will replace the D with something else. Maybe by the end of the series, instead of the D, people will call themselves straw hats or something along those lines. All right, so with all that being said, thank you guys so much for sticking by until the end of the video. I really freaking appreciate all the support you guys show this channel. Please consider liking, commenting, and subbing down below if you haven't already. And yeah, uh, thank you to the Patreon members and new channel members here on the side. You guys are awesome as well. And I will catch you guys on the next video, which should be a highlight reel of the live stream and then the par collab. And then we'll get straight into 1068 with no breaks. Catch you guys next time. Sai, signing out. Peace.